지금 이유를 모르겠는데 이게 지금 안 들어오고 있어서. 들어가는데 저게 유, 켜져 있다. 이게 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 아, 지금 이거를 이걸로 입력하는 저거 한번 테스트해보면 안 되나? 지금요? 어쩌면 원래 말이죠? 죄송합니다. <웃음> <웃음> 아, 죄송합니다. talk about the uh, flexibility of planar graphs. Uh, so let's talk about planar graphs. So we'll talk about uh, planar graphs are four colorable. Uh, this is the base of all the coloring results in graph theory. And before actually Apple and Hecken proved that the planar graphs are four colorable, uh, as an attempt to solve the four color problem, uh, in 1959, uh, Groch actually <coughs> solved uh, the coloring problem for planar graphs without triangles. So if you're a planar graph with uh, no triangles, uh, which means graph at least four, then you know you're three colorable. Okay. But actually he proved uh, something uh, stronger, something a little bit stronger, or maybe much stronger, uh, which is if you give me a planar graph with no triangles, then every proper three coloring of a four cycle or a five cycle, it extends to the entire graph. So this was a, uh, a very important result. And the question is, uh, so one direction you can go is, what happens for longer cycles? Uh, you give me a planar graph with no triangles, and now you try to extend some proper three coloring of a longer cycle. Does it always extend? Or of course, it doesn't always extend. So can you characterize all the graphs that does not extend? So this is uh, also known as. Uh, S critical for K color. So usually when you say a graph is uh, K critical, you're, you're looking at the smallest obstruction per se. You're saying the graph right now is K colorable, but if you look at any proper subgraph, so if you remove any edge, then it becomes uh, K minus one colorable. And as an extension of this definition, you can think of this as uh, this definition, S critical for K coloring. So this basically means that S is uh, pre-colored. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to say uh, there exists some K coloring of this uh, pre-colored set such that it extends to G minus E, but it doesn't extend to the entire graph. Right? I mean, you don't have to actually try to understand this uh, definition. All it means is that you're trying to figure out if it extends or not. And you want to figure out the smallest such obstruction. Is S a set of vertices? Yes, S is a set of vertices. <coughs> so now you can re rephrase this question. You can say, if you give me a cycle C such that it's uh, three colored, so it's properly three colored, you can ask uh, which of these uh, planar graphs without a triangle uh, are they uh, critical in this sense? Right? Which ones are the obstructions or not? So the theorem by Groch, and later kind of simplified by Aksyonov, says that uh, there are no such graphs if uh, you consider a four cycle or a five cycle. Right? It means all of the pre-colorings extend. And because of this, if you want to consider <coughs> further cycles, now it means that all of your graphs, all of these obstructions, they cannot contain a separating four cycle or a five cycle because you're considering the smallest such graph. If it contains 
a separating five cycle, then you remove stuff inside the five cycle. It would extend to the five cycle, and now you put the thing back in, and it, it extends to the entire graph. Right? So from now on, when we consider this uh, C critical for three coloring, now it's a necessary condition that there's no separating four cycles and five cycles. So what, did, what to do next? Now you want to look into six cycles. Right? And six cycles, this was also solved by uh, Gimbel and Thomason in 97, and later uh, simplified by Aksenov, uh, Borodin, and Glebov. They said, OK, if you're a planar graph with, with no triangles, and if you have a six cycle, which is pre-colored, then the only case such that this pre-coloring does not extend to the entire graph is is if the six cycle is colored uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, so cyclically, and whatever inside is a quadrangulation. So this means it's a grid. So whenever, so in particular, this means there are infinitely many graphs, and well, there's one coloring of a six cycle, and infinitely many graphs such that this does not exist, extend. So you can imagine stuff like this. So this hashed, or this grid part, means uh, quadrangulation. So if you look at a six cycle, and if you have two quadrangulations like this, of course you cannot extend this uh, pre-coloring, because right now it's not even properly colored. Uh, the second part here, this is also a quadrangulation inside, and as you can see, it, there's no color to use on this central vertex, because we're doing three colors. And even for this other case, inside it's still a quadrangulation, you're forced to use color three on these two vertices, so you cannot extend this. Right? So basically, uh, for six cycles, the only case when it does not extend to the entire graph is when there's a quadrangulation inside, and the coloring on this six cycle is one, two, three, one, two, three. Right? Hopefully that makes sense. So what to do next? Uh, of course, the next thing to do is you go to seven cycles. And for seven cycles, uh, the same group of people, Aksenov, Borodin, and Glebov, they also were successful. They characterized all the pre-colorings at all the graphs such that it does not extend. And there, I've drawn three such graphs. But in some sense, uh, they overlap. Mm -hmm. Because this thing over here, the very right, uh, these vertices, the one in the middle, they can be identified with uh, these two vertices on the boundary as well. Okay. So the only condition is that this hash part has to be a quadrangulation. Okay. So if this one is identified over here, and if this one is identified over here, you get this. Oh, or maybe not. Oh no, you get this one. Right? So like this, is, this means a <coughs> five face. You identify here, identify here, it becomes a quadrangulation, and you get this over here. But these are the only three types of graphs. And the coloring has to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2 for the one at the very right. The middle one, uh, it just says 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. And of course, the one in the very middle, this gets to be forced to be 3. So this 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 becomes a 6 cycle, and it's the same thing as over here. So you're like building up the type of graphs you have from the previous cases. Uh, what's next? Of course, you go into eight cycles. And this was done by uh, Zdeniak Dvorak and uh, Bernard Lutitsky. Uh, the notation is the same. The hash part is quadrangulations. Uh, this is two five faces. These are two five faces. This is a six face. And of course, some of these vertices can be identified. Same thing over here. Uh, these can be identified, and you will get something over here. But the bottom line is, we know all of these. Uh, we all we know exactly all the cases when the coloring extends or not. And of course, the next thing is to do nine cycles, and this is joint work with uh, Honza Eckstein, Premek Holub, and Bernard Ludzicki from before. And in this case, we have uh, a lot of cases. So part of this was done by uh, computers, but the main part was uh, 
figuring out how to glue all these uh, quadrangulations to each other. And uh, if you see these arrows, these arrows basically mean uh, how to pre-color vertices on the outer boundary. So this has some relation with the uh, with uh, the flow thing. Of uh, if you give me a planar graph with a three coloring, it will correspond to some flow properties of the planar graph. So we use that uh, relation back and forth, and we stuck it into a computer. Uh, took care of all the bad cases by hand, and we let the computer do all the case analysis. <laughs> okay. But in uh, the end, did you write down all the proof? And yes, yes. Right, yeah. So what we did is <laughs> we said, okay, if you are C critical for three coloring, where C is a nine cycle, then these graphs must satisfy the property that either you have a three phi phases, these are three phi phases, or you have a phi phase and a six phase, or you have two phi phases, or one six phase, or one phi phase. And now you see how these faces must appear in your graph. Okay. Uh, and then uh, from 10 cycles and above, it's uh, basically open. So if you're interested, you can actually look at this paper by uh, myself, uh, Eckstein, Holub, and Lidzki. And you can just use the same techniques. And you can try to see if you can make a computer calculate all these graphs. Uh, just a warning is that, as you can see, the number of uh, templates I have increased. So it will probably be a gigantic mess. But there's uh, a lot of people here, so maybe if you divide up the <laughs> cases, uh, maybe you can conquer the next case. So this is uh, planar graphs, uh, triangle free. And you're trying to extend the three coloring of uh, a cycle. So what's next? So maybe this was too hard. So now, maybe instead of just triangle free, maybe you can go to girth five. So now you forbid a triangle and a four cycle. And in this situation, the analysis is much easier because now you don't have quadrangulations. Remember back here, all of these uh, hashes, all of these grids were triangulations. But now you're basically forbidding all the quadrangulations as well. And in this case, uh, Life is simple because we actually, there are only this many graphs. Even when C is at most 11, uh, what's even better is that we actually know all the graphs. Right? So uh, Dvorak and Kawabaya Yashi, uh, these two people actually came up, a, came up with a re recursive description for all of the C critical uh, graphs for three coloring if your planar graph is girth 5. So now we know all the graphs, and using this description, uh, Zdenek Dvorak and Bernard Leditsky, they actually, the same thing, right? They made a computer do all these computations, and they have an explicit list of all the uh, C-critical graphs when C has length at most 16. Okay. And they didn't do this just for fun, they did this to apply it to other uh, coloring problems. <coughs> So this is one reason you study uh, pre-coloring, right? It's not only because of the fun of itself, but also it helps you solve other problems because pre-coloring is, is in some sense stronger, right? You get a stronger result to apply it to other problems you can solve. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, so this, uh, this question mark here by uh, Dvorak and Kawa Rabayashi is this paper seems to be on the archive and have not been submitted. Okay. So I think I asked Zdenek a couple years ago and he told me the paper is too long that nobody would want to read it so they're not going <laughs> to <read it. laughs> I don't know if they've changed their mind and if it's been submitted now but that was the status a couple years ago. Okay. So now uh, what we, now what we want to do is, instead of trying to pre-color an, enti an entire cycle, uh, you try to pre-color certain vertices. Right? Maybe this is easier. Right? You try to color some vertex and try to see if it extends. Right? 
And the whole reason in the past, or well, the previous slide, the whole reason we did this for three colorings is that we had this result by uh, Groch that said if you're a planar graph with no triangles, then we know it's three colorable. So we want to extend it to a three coloring. But now, since we don't have this condition where you forbid a triangle, but we still have this theorem that says uh, planar graphs are four colorable. So maybe you want to four color vertices. Right? You have some subset of the vertices where these vertices are pre-colored, but you use four colors, and you want to see if it extends to the uh, entire graph. Right? And of course, your first thought should be, uh, this is impossible. Right? Because if I give you two vertices, and if I want those two vertices to be the same color, and if they're adjacent, of course, <coughs> this is impossible. Right? The whole reason we, I didn't talk about that previously is because we were talking about uh, critical graphs. But now we don't talk about critical graphs. We just want to see when it extends or not. Right? So now, if I give you some pre-colored set, uh, the assumption is that for every pre-coloring of this set, you want it to extend. And of course, you want to pre-color with four colors because we know planar graphs are four-colorable, so you want to use four colors. And the bad thing here is uh, this is basically impossible, right? Because not only because of the example I said about adjacent vertices, even if you try to pre-color two vertices, and even if these vertices are arbitrary far apart, there are graphs where you cannot extend this, right? And this is very simple, right? You just have you have a vertex and you have a triangle, a triangle, and you connect everything. So now if you have a vertex over here, which is one, these must be two, three, four, and you are basically forced to have these vertices to have the same color. And I can make this distance arbitrary long, right? You have to include more triangles in the middle. So you can come up with some construction that says if you're trying to extend the pre-coloring, where the pre-colored vertices only have four colors, then even if the vertices have distance arbitrarily long, it's impossible. So yeah, so a distance constraint, this is uh, still impossible. So what do you do? Now, the next step, of course, is to see, can you do it for five colors? Now, if you're given a planar graph, and some of these vertices are pre-colored, but now you're allowed to use uh, one more color. So the pre-colorings have five colors, and the entire graph, you allow five colors. Okay, so can you extend this? Okay. And this was basically a question by uh, Thomason in 97. And I'll explain the question mark later. Uh, so he asked this question. He said, does there exist a constant such that if you give me a planar graph where some of the vertices are pre-colored, but the pre-colored vertices are sufficiently far apart from each other? If they're very, very far apart from each other, uh, can you always extend this pre-color? And now, because of this example, you have uh, five colors instead of four. Right? So now you have this flexibility. And he asked, uh, is 100 suffice? Okay. And the reason, uh, the reason there's a question mark here is, if you actually look at his paper, he doesn't ask this question. He asks a stronger one, because uh, I assume before this was published, uh, Albertson proved this theorem. <laughs> he said, yes, you can do it. And uh, even distance at least four is sufficient. And not only this, he said, well, this is tight. I can give you a planar graph where vertices are pre-colored, and the distance between the pre-colored vertices are three, and you cannot extend it. So if you look at uh, this paper by Thomason, uh, Instead of asking this, he asks a different variant, uh, which I won't get into right now. So the proof is not so hard. It's, uh, yeah. I was thinking maybe I'll go into the proof, but uh, yeah, we don't have time. <laughs> but it's an easy exercise. Uh, undergrad students can probably even do it. And uh, tightness is also an easy exercise by using this uh, non four choosable planar graph by uh, yeah, the, the smallest non four choosable planar graph. It has the additional assumption that uh, all the lists have only five colors. 
So using this step, you can construct the counterexample when the distance is only three. So I'll leave it at that. So <coughs> if you actually look into this proof by uh, Albertson, he proves uh, something much stronger. Right? Or actually, rather, I should say, the fact that your graph is planar isn't actually used all that much. The only fact that the graph is planar was used was the four-color theorem. Okay? So what he actually proved is that if you give me a k-colorable graph, if the chromatic number is k, and if the pre-colored vertices have distance uh, at least four, then you can always extend it to a k plus one color. So if you have one more color than your chromatic number, then you can always extend the color. And he proved one more result, which says, now he gives a sufficient condition such that uh, if you want to lower the distance, so instead of having pairwise distance 4, if you have pairwise distance 3, now the same conclusion can be reached if your graph is k-choosable instead of uh, k-colorable. Right? So it's a smaller class of graphs. So the distance constraint can be uh, weakened a little bit. So now the question naturally comes into, uh, can you do sort of the same thing with uh, list coloring? Right? The entire storyline up to now was uh, you have some graph, in particular some planar graph, and some of these vertices are pre-colored, and you're interested to see if this pre-coloring -pre extends or not to the entire graph. But now you want to extend this to a uh, list coloring version. Right? So now in list coloring, uh, I assume everybody knows what list coloring is, so I won't go into the definition. But uh, you give me, so now you give me a planar graph, and you have some list assignment. And the list size, of course, has to be 5, because uh, this result by Thomason. Right? Thomason's result says uh, planar graphs are 5 choosable. And of course, Voigt constructed this graph. Uh, which is not for choosable. Okay. And because choosability of planar graphs is 5, now you have to consider uh, 5 list assignments. And you want to say some of your vertices, they are pre-colored from their lists. So now you fix a color for each of the vertices, and you want to see if it extends or not. Okay. So actually, uh, Thomason's proof, it says one vertex can be pre-colored. Right? So Thomason's proof says two vertices, two adjacent vertices, uh, can be pre-colored, pre-colored, mm -hmm. if they receive different colors. Right? But now we, when I say pre-colored, I mean any coloring. Right? So Thomason, Thomason's proof says if you have two adjacent vertices, if they have, a, if if you prefer, if you pre-color them with the same vertex, uh, same color, of course it doesn't extend. So Albertson, in his uh, paper, actually asked the same <coughs> question Thomason asked, it, except now it's the list col coloring version. Right? It says, does there exist some constant such that if the pre-colored vertices, pre-colored means you pick, a vert you pick a color from its list, and if these vertices are pairwise distance far apart from each other, does it always extend to an L coloring, to a list coloring? And in particular, he asked, uh, is 4 enough? Because the distance constraint for ordinary coloring was also 4. And a couple of years later, uh, Tuza and Voigt, the same Voigt who constructed mm -hmm. this uh, counterexample, uh, constructed a counterexample saying p equals 4 is not enough, so p has to be at least 5. Uh, they actually constructed a graph. Uh, such that the pre-colored vertices, the pre-colored vertices actually have three colors. Right? So they, they constructed a counterexample uh, that's somewhat stronger. Right? And then what's known is uh, Aksanovich, Hutchison, and Lastrina. They said, okay, if you give me two vertices, if you pre-color two vertices, and if you have the additional constraint that there's no separating three cycle or four cycle, then it always extends to the entire graph. And as far as I know, these, are, these were the only partial results until uh, two years ago. Uh, 
Dvorak, Lidicki, Mohor, and Postel, uh, they solve this conjecture. Right? But the constant here is, uh, is uh, 20,000. And I'm sure it, it's not tight, so we can go. <laughs> so this sort of ends the story for pre-coloring uh, vertices with distance constraints. But if you remember, uh, the very first slide, <coughs> there was this uh, Groch's theorem that said any three coloring of a four cycle and a five cycle extends to a three coloring of the entire planar graph. And you can ask the same thing for list coloring. You can say if you give me a planar graph with lists of size five, and you want to pre-color some cycle and see if it extends to the entire graph or not. And as far as I can tell, there's only one result uh, by Bueme, Mohar, and Stevens, which says these are the only uh, critical graphs. In other words, if you want to extend the five list coloring of a planar graph, and the pre-colored part consists of a cycle of length at most six, then it must contain one of these four graphs. Otherwise, it always extends. And what's interesting to me is uh, it sort of seems like a coloring result, but because you don't actually use the full power of the lists, right? All the lists. Like here, you're basically forcing all of these triangles to have the same two colors. And here, you're forcing this edge to have the same one color. And now you're using all of the five colors in this list on the boundary. So I think it will be very interesting to try to uh, extend this to uh, seven cycles as well. But uh, I don't know any such rule. Okay. Okay. So for the past 25 minutes, maybe, I've talked about all of these uh, pre-coloring results. And uh, one thing I've learned is pre-coloring is very hard. So maybe trying to extend the pre-coloring is too much. Right? Uh, what's trying to extend pre-coloring means? It means if you give me any pre-coloring, if you fix a pre-coloring, then you try to extend it to the entire graph. But maybe that's too much, and maybe you're being too greedy. So what uh, Dvorak, Noreen, and Postel said, instead of trying to extend all of the pre-colorings, Maybe you want to extend sufficiently many of them. Right? So maybe you want to, s to satisfy only some fraction of your requests. So instead of pre-coloring, now I'll say these are requests. Right? And I'll throw a bunch of definitions, and we'll go through them very slowly. Okay? So what I mean by a request is that now, if you think of a graph, we're always going to be talking about list coloring. So a graph always has some list assignment on top of it. And a request just means you, for the domain of this function, you always pick a color in its list. Okay? So this does not mean every vertex has a request. Right? Some of the vertices do. Maybe some of them don't. Right? Maybe only one of the vertex. Maybe only one vertex has a request. Maybe all of them do. The only thing that matters is that when you have a request, this request must come from its list. Okay. So this is what means, this is what a request means. And now I'll say a request is epsilon satisfiable if there exists some L coloring. Okay. Remember your graph has some list assignment on it. We call that L. And if there exists an L coloring such that the request you've given for a vertex matches the color obtained by this L coloring for an epsilon fraction of the vertices. So maybe not all of them do, but for an epsilon fraction of the domain of the function, remember the domain is some subset of the vertices, not all of the vertices, some, domain, some subset. For the vertices that have requests, oops, for the vertices that have requests, you want an epsilon fraction of them to match the color given by this L coloring. So this is what it means to be epsilon satisfiable. So in particular, if your graph is one satisfiable, that means you've extended the pre-coloring, right? because you're satisfying the entire domain of the request. Okay. 
So when you say graph is epsilon satisfiable? You say a graph with a list assignment uh -huh. is epsilon satisfiable. Uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you say, if you give me a graph with a list assignment, you say a request is epsilon satisfiable. Okay. So now what you say is you give me a graph and a list assignment on this graph. Now you think of all the requests, all the possible requests you can have. If every request is epsilon satisfiable, you say this graph with this list assignment is epsilon flexible. And now you say a graph is epsilon flexible. If you say a graph is epsilon flexibly k-choosable if your graph with a list assignment is epsilon flexible for all the k-list assignments. Mm -hmm. So this is a bunch of definitions. I hope that was clear. So you don't care the set s? You don't care. So I mean, in the end, you care about this. Okay. So you care if your graph is epsilon flexible for all the k-list assignments. And if this is epsilon flexible, this means every request is epsilon satisfiable. So if you say a graph is epsilon flexibly k choosable, that means you fix a graph, all the possible list assignments, all the possible requests for that list assignment is always epsilon satisfiable. Is this clear? Uh, so don't you want to have a condition on the like legible set S? S? The domain? Yeah, the domain. Uh, it just has to be a subset of the vertices for all the requests. So there's no particular condition. Because, yeah, I mean, the origin of the question comes from here, the very top, right? Uh, extending the, a pre-coloring maybe is too hard. You want to satisfy some fraction, but the adversary gives you the request. It says, no matter how hard you give me the request, I, I am going to be able to satisfy a fraction of those. So if S is the whole vertex set, then this could still be a request? Yes. That just means every vertex has a preferred color. Right. And if it, so that doesn't need to be a proper coloring, no. you say? The request itself does not need to be proper. So, so how can that request be epsilon set? Epsilon is a quarter, maybe. Or color. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, does there exist an epsilon? Uh, oh, did I not write there? Yes. No, epsilon is constant. Right? So yeah, epsilon is constant. You think of that one as possible. Okay. Sorry. So here's uh, an example. So if I give you a four cycle, this is always two choosable. Okay. Whichever list I assign to the vertices, if I say every vertex has two colors, then you can always L color this. But if I give you lists like this, And say, I want this vertex to have color one. Okay. There's no way this works. Right? Because if I say this has one, I'm forced to use three here, which means I'm forced to use four here, which means I have nothing to use here. Okay. So in particular, this graph is not, there's no epsilon such that this graph is epsilon flexibly two choosable. Uh -huh. Because for this, particular set of lists and this particular request, I cannot satisfy. Okay. okay. So I've thrown you a new concept. And the concept is defined for list coloring. But let's try to think of it for ordinary coloring and see how it works out. Uh, two observations will be made. The first one is, if you give me a graph such that it's epsilon 
flexibly k colorable, then epsilon cannot be too high. It's at most uh, 1 over k. And this is uh, easy, well, easy after you understand all the definitions, because you can just say, you can just give me uh, kk, and you say all vertices, they want the color one. So now you cannot satisfy two other requests. If, because the end condition is that it must be some L color, you have to be able to finish the free color. And if you say all the vertices want one color, you can only satisfy one over k of them. So epsilon can never be one over k. I mean, it can never be more than one over k. And the surprising, or maybe not surprising result is if you give me a k colorable graph, then it's always going to be 1 over k flexible. And this, uh, this so in my that, opinion, is that particular list of signs. Everybody has the same list. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at uh, ordinary proper coloring. So all the lists are the same. So what I'm basically saying is for proper colorings, this concept of flexibility is completely solved. Okay. The best you can do is, the best you can try to do is try to satisfy uh, 1 over k fraction of the requests, and you can actually achieve that 1 over k. And I'll give you a proof of that. So the proof is, So what this means is your vertex set can be partitioned into k independent sets. So now you have k independent sets. But uh, remember we're trying to do flexibility, which means some of these vertices have uh, preferred colors preferred colors or requests. So I'll partition each independent set into k plus 1 parts, right? because there are some vertices that don't have any requests. So this, these will request. This will require 1. These will want 2. These will want 3. And all the way down here, uh, this will they want k, and here there are no requests. They're just happy with whatever color they want. So when you say requests here, you, so you, you have one request, and this is uh, what the request tells us that these vertices yes. should be covered. Okay. I'm saying uh, your k colorable graph, each vertex will be one of these independent sets. And for so you look at a k colorable graph and one request. And this is one the request. Okay. And I'll solve for an arbitrary request. You can satisfy yeah. 1 over k fraction of it, which means your graph is 1 over k flexibly k color. <laughs> okay, so what do you do? You have a it's k colorable, which means if this is a complete k partite graph, the only thing you can do is give the k colors like this or some permutation of it. But if you fix one permutation, let's say if I gave the colors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way up to k, then you look at all the vertices such that the request is satisfied. So this will be satisfied. These will be satisfied. All the way down here, this will be satisfied. Okay. And now I give you a different permutation. Maybe I say 2, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to k. So now this will be satisfied. This will be satisfied. Something like this. Okay? So for each permutation, there will be a subset of, of the vertices where the request will be satisfied. And if you go over all the permutations, then each vertex here will be covered exactly uh, k minus 1 factorial times. 
So you have k factorial colorings, and each vertex is colored k minus 1 factorial times, which means fissional principle, right? Yeah. For one of the colorings, at least 1 over k of the vertices, the requests will be satisfied. So this is a simple proof. Any questions? So, so when you say if G is epsilon flexibly k colorable and epsilon is less than one on k, yes. you mean that there is a graph which is epsilon flexibly k colorable where epsilon is less than one over k? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This means epsilon can never be more than one over k. But that's not true for every graph. That's true for like k. Uh, so oh. so I'll, I'll click give an example. Yeah, but an odd cycle is a counterexample. Oh, odd cycle? An odd cycle is three colorable. It's three colorable. But flexibility is higher than one third. Odd cycle is three colorable. If I take a very large odd cycle. And epsilon flexibility. Uh, uh, I get it approximately half. Well, so this means uh, <coughs> the one more all graphs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, okay, so ah, it's, it's right. a uni okay, okay. You want to have a universal upper bound. I was trying to say I want this statement to be true. Yeah, yeah this, this is tied in some sense, yeah. but it's, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Sorry, this statement independently is not true. Good, good. Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah. So this means if you give me a d degenerate graph, your graph is d plus one colorable, which means you're always one over d plus one flexibly d plus one colorable. Okay. This means you can always satisfy, and this means there exists some epsilon such that you can always satisfy this fraction of the requests. But this is boring, right? Because of uh, ordinary coloring, we already know the answer. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is for list coloring. Okay. And for list coloring, this is actually open. Uh, it open in one, what sense? Uh, open in the sense that Zdenek uh, Dvorak, Sergei Norin, and Luke Posto, they ask this question. Can you actually do the same thing <coughs> for choosability? So this. And uh, same question. So what do they do is they actually prove it for d plus 2 colors. Okay. So if your graph is d degenerate, you know it's d plus 1 choosable. And the question is, can you always satisfy some epsilon fraction of the requests? They said maybe. But if you have one more color, if your list size is d plus 2, then there exists some epsilon. And it's not, epsilon is not too bad. It's like 1 over d to the d to the d or something. And then they go ahead and they say, well, d d instead of d degenerate graphs, they look into a maximum average degree. So if maximum average degree is uh, small, but bigger than d degenerate graphs, then you can still obtain the result you want. So d degenerate graphs, uh, maximum average degree. This is uh, sparse graphs. Right? And I don't know about you, but whenever I look at sparse graphs, it reminds me of a planar graphs. And yeah, planar graphs. And because we have these results, uh, Thomason proved planar graphs are five choosable. Uh, triangle free are four choosable. This is like a folklore result. And if you forbid even four cycles, then it becomes three choosable. Uh, the originators of flexibility ask the same question for these, these classes. We know there are five choosable, four choosable, three choosable, but are they actually epsilon flexibly uh, that number choosable? Right. So they're asking uh, much more. Right. If you give me some request, can you satisfy a fraction of those? Right. So they have this question. Uh, the second one was recently solved by uh, 
Dvorak, uh, Masaryk, Musilev, and uh, Pangrak. I don't know if I read that correctly. <laughs> so the second one, they solved it. Uh, some discharging, very long and tedious discharging. Uh, towards the <coughs> third question, the third question asks, if you're planar with girth 5, can you do three colors? They said, uh, maybe, but you can definitely do it with six colors. Okay. So it's unknown. So this third question is still open. Uh, same group of people. And actually, uh, the originators, towards the first question, is probably the most interesting one, are planar graphs. Uh, flexibly five choosable. They, one of their results uh, in their original paper, they say it's flexibly six choosable. So if you give me one more color, then it's possible. And towards this direction, uh, Masari uh, proved that if you're playing with no four cycles, then you're flexibly five choosable. So Dvorak, Norin, and Postel, they said if you fix the class of planar graphs, and you want to lower the number of colors, they said five, we don't know, but six is possible. And uh, Tomas Masaryk, he said, well, maybe let's try to fix the number of colors, and you try to expand the class of, the subclass of planar graphs, which you know are flexibly five choosable. And this is where me and my co-authors jumped in, and we uh, sort of extended this class. So if you're a planar graph with no adjacent triangles, then you are uh, flexibly five choosable. And this is the biggest subclass of planar graphs that's known to be uh, flexibly five choosable so far. Uh, we actually proved, uh, yeah, th this is one other result we proved. Uh, no four, five, six cycles, this is flexibly four choosable. And the reason we proved this is initially I wanted to prove no four cycle, five cycle is flexibly four choosable because that would be a, an analog of Steinberg's conjecture for those who know what Steinberg's conjecture is. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't get rid of the six cycle. But uh, very recently, uh, Yang and Yang, they posted something on the archive that said uh, if you're planar and no four cycle, five cycle, which is exactly the class of uh, the class of planar graphs Steinberg was interested in, uh, they said this was uh, flexibly four choosable. And this number four is tight because we know for planar graphs without four cycles and five cycles, uh, they're not even three colorable. Okay. So back to this question. Uh, Actually, the answer when D is 1 for this question is uh, easy. Uh, when D is 1, it just means uh, forests. Okay? So forests, can you, uh, yeah, is your graph flexibly too choosable is the question. And this is also some relatively easy exercise, so I'll leave it there. And I was surprised when I first looked at this. Uh, People wanted to investigate all these planar graph stuff, and then they asked if stuff are known for outer planar. And they told me nothing is known for outer planar. Mm -hmm. I mean, outer planar graphs are uh, too degenerate. So by uh, the result that d plus two colors suffice, it's epsilon flexible for choosable. But the question is, can you do it with three colors? So we asked this question, and Recently, uh, Goran Park and my postdoc, Eun Gyeong Cho, we proved that the two trees are, there exists some epsilon such that these are uh, flexibly three choosable. And you know, two trees are, yeah, outer planar graphs are a subclass of two trees, so we proved this question. And when we were trying to type it up, we found on the archive, uh, one week ago, uh, <laughs> uh, Bradshaw, Masaryk, and Stacho, one of my co-authors teamed up with other people and they actually proved the same result. And, but they proved even more. And they proved this uh, tree depth set. But the main question for D equals two, it's uh, still open. Uh, yeah. okay. 
running out of time. Uh, okay, so usually I don't talk about proofs whenever I talk about discharging results <laughs> because uh, discharging is just some averaging argument. But now we're not talking about uh, simple uh, coloring or choosability. We're talking about this epsilon flexibility. And there's this gigantic definition and gigantic lemma, which gives you a tool of how to generate these uh, reducible configurations. Okay. So, so maybe I'll just briefly talk about it. So the idea of trying to obtain reducible configurations is uh, you have some subgraph H. You have your graph G and you have some subgraph H. And reducible configurations is just induction, right? You remove this graph H, you obtain some coloring on G, and you try to extend it onto H. Right? But this doesn't work for uh, flexibility, right? Because for flexibility, you're not this you're not extending only the coloring, but you also want to satisfy these uh, requests as well. So here, you have this thing called uh, fix and forward, which gives you uh, two more conditions on how, to, uh, on how to obtain reducible configurations. So, so usually, if you're going for a four coloring, Then you, you would say uh, there's no three vertex. And the reason you say there's no three vertex is that if you had a vertex of degree three, you have your graph, you remove this graph, you obtain some coloring by induction, and when you try to put, put it back in, you only have three neighbors, but you have four colors, so you can extend the coloring back, which means this three vertex is reducible. Right? This three vertex does not appear in your uh, minimum counter. Right? But now, when you deal with flexibility, if you want to say, what if this vertex had a request on it? Right? Now you want to deal with epsilon flexible, which means you want to satisfy an epsilon proportion of your requests. So maybe over here, when you remove this, maybe this graph with the request, uh, maybe an epsilon fraction of it was satisfied. And the list here was one, two, three, four. And you prefer one. But maybe one, two, three already appeared here. So you are forced to use a color four here. Which means if you look at the graph as a whole, you did not satisfy an epsilon fraction of the requests. Okay. Maybe it was exactly epsilon here. And now you have one more request, but you didn't satisfy. Okay. So this is a problem. Okay. So. Yeah, I shouldn't talk about more. I should <laughs> not talk more about this. <laughs> but basically, if you go here, then you yeah, things go bad. Okay. And one way, uh, the way you prove this lemma that generates the reducible configuration for you, says uh, if you are a graph, if you are a graph L colorable some list assignment, then it says there exists some probability distribution such that for every vertex and every color in the list, if the probability that your vertex uses that color is at least epsilon, then your graph is epsilon flexible for this uh, list assignment. Right? So it basically means if you have a chance to use that color for that vertex, then you will be epsilon flexible. But you have to make sure this epsilon is a constant, right? which is uh, the hardest part. Okay, so what's left to do? Uh, these two questions, or three questions, are still open. Uh, you're welcome to try to go solve it. Uh, a bigger question is basically this. Uh, pick your favorite graph class, uh, look at the maximum choosability, and try to see if you can prove that you can extend that to flexibility. Uh, this turns out to be not trivial. Uh, there are only two classes, or two significant classes, where the flexibility and the choosability matches. So, uh, 
I'll stop it there. Thank you. Any questions? Number of uh, the number of secret critical requests. I mean, for cycle of length eight, we still many such obstruction like yes. surface. So I I wonder that whether there is some profound for the number of such. Requests. Uh, no, right? Because there's infinitely many. Uh -huh. Each graph was an infinitely many. Each yes. picture was an infinite family of graphs. But uh, there's a, if you phrase the question in a different way, then I can say yes, if this cooperates. Yeah. So here, the way we did this is I said, but we calculate the flows and we say, if your graph is a C critical for three coloring, then we know how it looks inside. We know it has three five faces, three five faces, what? Five face, six face, two five faces, and a, what, what is that? Six face? So this we know. So you can <coughs> sort of categorize the infinite family of graphs in this sense. And this number is known. Any other questions? Is there some other type of. Uh, uh, pre-coloring result where uh, you pre randomly pre-color the cycle and then the probability that expands kind of thing. Is that kind of thing happening? So, for instance, for five, this Thomson's proof gives you the result that uh, pre-coloring does, does expand when they have distinct colors. Yes. So, if I say, I mean, that the probability the, so the mode, uh, the probability that both vertices have the same color is like one over five. So with the kind of probability, the uh, pre-coloring extend. I mean, that would be much harder, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you want to, you basically want to figure out the number of colorings as well. I don't know. Yeah, but number of pre-colorings. So it's cycle is fixed, right? So yes. you only have a. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, each of these these uh, pictures, uh, there's actually more, right? Because maybe I should just say one one, right? but that's never appears. Uh -huh. These are all the non-trivial graphs. Sorry? And that's the question in your flag. So, so if we replace these five choosable with six choosable, is it the two? Is it moment? Uh, yes. This is the. Uh, Great. The one in the middle? Mm. The right, no, in. Which one? In the middle. Oh, there exists an epsilon. Oh, is it really tiny or is it some, some It's something computable, but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter, right? You just want to know some Yeah, but is it, like for, for user, the identical list, it's uh, one of our, the chromatic number when you're aiming. So for list coloring, do they have something like one over 100 or do they really have one over a million? Or it's some constant. <laughs> <laughs> Million, hundred, same rate. <laughs> I mean, everything is based on this, uh, this lemma then. So if you, if you define an epsilon such that this works, uh, then it will be. Uh, Not 
Let's thank the speaker again.